love that. Amen. We're going to continue on the same track as I was when I preached the last time. Last time, I don't know if you remember or not, but I preached about hearers of the faith, and I specifically talked about Rahab, and I felt to continue on that same path. So we're going to go, be going into another hero of the faith uh, named Abraham here this morning, and uh, you know, by, the, by faith, Abraham. And in the 11th chapter, if you want to turn to that, Hebrews chapter 11, 11th chapter of the New Testament book of Hebrews, there is one of the most famous lists of all history. It is a list of biblical heroes, big names like Noah and Moses and Samson and David. Uh, some of these big names are in through there, and Enoch and Rahab, of course, that we spoke about, and uh, Barak and Jephthah. And what was it that held all of these biblical characters together? What was it about these individuals that put them on this particular list? It was their faith. Their faith is what made them stand out. Their faith is what put them on that list that we have. And each of these men and women were heroes of faith. Probably one of the premier people on this list, though, is a man named Abraham. He takes up six of the 40 verses. And uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 is where we'll start. It says, By faith Abraham... When he was called to go out into a place which he should, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. Notice that word, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. He didn't know where he was going. God just told him to go. And by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country. He, he was unfamiliar with his surroundings. God put him in a strange place. Dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God. If we want to jump down to verse 17, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. In the last verse, it says, Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. We're going to speak for a few moments here this morning, of course, along the topic of this hero of the faith, Abraham. Amen. Let's just pray that God would have his hand upon the rest of the service. God, we are so thankful to be in your house. God, we are so thankful, Lord, that we can step, step into a house, Lord, with the body of believers. God, we can focus upon your word. God, your word is life. God, your word gives us strength. Your word encourages us, Lord. God, we just want to dive into it here this morning. God, we pray that you would speak into our hearts. God, speak into our lives. Challenge us, Lord, with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we think of examples of great faith, I mean, maybe your mind wanders to a number of individuals that you know or that are either here or have passed, and through all of Scripture, there is none that sticks out in our minds above the example of Abraham. His life was characterized by faith. When we first find Abraham, he is called by God to get up and leave everything that he has ever known. That's no small task. I don't know how many people have ever moved here before, but it's no, no small task to get up and move your whole family to a place that's unfamiliar to you. Now, in the case of Abraham, he was called by God. He was told by God to go to a place that God would show him. He didn't know where it was. He didn't even know where he was going. But God told him, go. And he starts on this journey that we see. He starts on this journey to go. And there have been many who have been called by God to do the same. Every missionary that is serving on a foreign field somewhere has been called to leave family, friends, comfort, and familiarity behind to fulfill God's will for their life. Leave everything behind. And I, I think we can all appreciate the amount of faith that, that, that it takes to do that. I think we can all admire that kind of faith to step out and say, God, I'm going to trust you with everything. I may not know where I'm going. I may not know where I'm going to end up, but I'm just going to put my trust and my faith in you, that you're going to see this through, that you were going to take care of me. And Abraham, he was willing to step out without having any idea of where he was going. 
A lot of people have answered God's call without really knowing where they'd end up. A lot of people just answered. They obeyed. He got up and he left family, friends, home, and culture without having the slightest idea of where he was supposed to go. He had to have faith that God was going to lead him. He had to have faith that God was going to lead him. He had to blindly follow. And he did. And he did it all at the ripe age of 75. That took a great amount of faith. That's a whole new chapter in your life. I know for my father, he was forced into another occupation after he had an accident at his former job that he was so accustomed to doing. He was working as a carpenter for 33 years, had a life-changing accident take place after 33 years of being a foreman in carpentry, and all of a sudden, things changed. Life threw him a curveball, and he had to take another career path. And being at the age that he was at was going to be a challenge. You know, and... uh, at least the saying that says it is possible to teach an old dog new tricks. 75 years old, Abraham, he steps into faith. He has a great amount of faith. But that wasn't the only trial of Abraham's faith. If that was it, we could understand that. We could understand for ourselves. okay, if if God calls me to go to a certain place, I I can understand that. I, I can appreciate that kind of faith that it takes. It doesn't stop there with Abraham's life. The Bible tells us that he believed God concerning his promise to give him many descendants. God had promised him that, and he lived in tents as a foreigner in a land occupied by many others, believing that this land would one day be given to him and his descendants from God. He lived in a foreign land. and While he was living there amongst foreigners, He was believing that God was going to fill that land with his descendants and that that land would be theirs. What an incredible faith that is. Just like the faith of Joshua. Joshua, he was an incredible man, an incredible leader, the predecessor of Moses, and he steps to the forefront to lead the people of Israel, and God tells him, every single place that your foot touches is yours. Every single place that you go, it's just like Lion King, everything the light touches is yours. (laughs) Every single thing that, every single place that you walk, now, if I was Joshua, I wouldn't stop walking. This is mine. This is mine. This is mine. Every single place that he went was his. It ended up being his. And we come back to the story of Abraham, and it was the same sort of mentality. God was promising him this promised land. He didn't know where it was going to be. He didn't know how it was going to work out. He didn't know when his descendants would come along. He, He is 75. Let me remind you of that. He's 75, and God is promising him all of these dreams, all of these incredible promises that he holds so dear. And Abraham is waiting for them to take place. God tells him to step out and move. And he gets to the place where he is supposed to go at, and camps there. God tells him that he is going to have descendants more numerous than the stars. Wow, God, that's an incredible promise. But nobody told Abraham that he would have to wait 25 years to even see a glimmer of that. Nobody told Abraham that the wait was going to be that long. I, I don't know about you, but me, I, I get a bit a- antsy with things. We're kind of a, a microwave generation, if we will. We've heard that statement before, I'm sure. We want things now. We want to say, see things happen immediately. You know, we go through traffic, and maybe not everybody's like me. Maybe you, all of you are patient and all of that. But you get going, and somebody in front of you is going 10 below the speed limit. And you start getting a little antsy, moving around in your seat, wondering whether or not you should start honking the horn. Uh, no, none of you would do that. <laughs> and thank you for your honesty. And, uh, you know, 
we, we do that. We do that. We have this problem with waiting. We wait in lines. And, you know, I was just, uh, just last night, I stopped into the superstore to go and get some, some food. And, you know, I, it was at the, the delivery place that's there. I don't know if you know where I'm talking about. But as soon as you walk in, there's, there's a little place there where you can get pizza and chicken and fries and all of that. And to a bunch of people that are waiting for lunch to come, I'm sure that all sounds really good. So I went in, and, and I was waiting for, uh, waiting for my turn to come. And all of a sudden, this, this guy comes in, and there was me and another lady waiting. And he butted right in front of both of us and just starts ordering. And the lady seemed really perturbed, like, I, I was here first, and he didn't pay any attention to her and just kept on ordering. And uh, she looks over at me like, what do we do? <laughs> I'm like, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> I'm Canadian. We'll just keep it this way. And uh, so that's, that's what we did, you know. But we, we get frustrated with things like that. We get frustrated with waiting. How about 25 years of waiting? God, God, you promised me this, and you promised me that I'd see it in my lifetime. Just show me a glimmer. If this is actually going to happen, Lord, a year's gone by, two years have gone by, three years have gone by, I, I don't see your promise happening. You know, I'm, I'm 78, I'm 79, I'm 80, uh, nothing's happening, Lord. I'm still living amongst foreigners and we're the only ones here. We feel completely, completely alone. There's no one else in this country like us. What are we doing? You called us here. You told us to go, but what's going on? What is happening? And I sh I'm sure that Abraham had these questions going on in his mind, like, when is this problem, wh when is this promise going to happen? But then, what I believe to be Abraham's greatest trial of faith came. Abraham had believed that God would give him an heir, even in his old age. He believed God for that. If God promised it, he believed it. There was no if, ands, or buts with Abraham. If God said he was going to do it, God never goes back on his word. It's going to take place. So when he was 100 years old and his wife, was Sarah, Sarah, was 90, can you just imagine this? Now, we had kids fairly young, my wife and I. Uh, you know, we, we had kids when we were, I was, oh, my goodness. Well, we had our last kid. I, we had our last kid when I was 27. My wife was 25. And uh, I, at that age, you know, it takes a lot of energy. It takes a ton of energy just to follow kids around. And I, you know, but to have a kid at 100, can you imagine the type of energy that you would need to just chase this toddler around and say, don't get into that, don't get into that, clean up your room, and you're running around constantly trying to take care of this at 100 years old. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine that. And uh, here Abraham is, and finally, their promise comes. He gets to hold his promise. That little baby boy is born, and he had faith that God would give him a son, and God did give him a son. But then God did something completely, completely shocking. He asked Abraham to do something so unspeakable. He asked him to take that promised son, Isaac, and sacrifice him in an, on an altar to God. I don't know if you know what's required in this, but in the Old Testament, sacrifices, they were a mess. They, they would build an altar. They would lay wood on the altar. They would take this lamb. They would kill the lamb. They would lay it on the altar, and they would burn the sacrifice. And Abraham, Abraham, he, first of all, if that was us, how could God ask to do such a thing? How could he take away something that Abraham had waited 25 years for? God, you know how long I've waited for this promise. Why would you ask me to give it up? 
Abraham was promised by God that he would have a son, and through this son, God will fulfill the promise that he made to Abraham that his descendants would be more numerous than the stars. And here we have this complete stop. What is going on? 25 years passed before this promise was fulfilled, and then they finally held this promise in their hands, and God asked Abraham to give it up. It doesn't make any sense, Lord. It doesn't make any sense. Can I get a witness here tonight that there's been some things in our life that don't make any sense? That happens. There's been some things that go on in our life, and we say, God, what are you doing? What is going on in our situation right now? Do you still know where I'm at? Do you still know what I'm going through? Do you still know this is a struggle for me? Genesis chapter 22, it starts to tell us a story, and it says it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, test in other words, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. Abraham was always ready to hear from God. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, And get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham, he rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went unto the place of which God had told him. Let me just get to this. God, God talked with Abraham, and he tells him that he must go to a certain mountain and offer his son for a sacrifice. And the Bible tells us that the very next morning, Abraham, he doesn't delay. He doesn't wait and say, okay, let me just say my goodbyes here. Abraham, he gets ready and he goes the next morning. He gathers everything that he needs for the trip and he heads out with his son. Now, if anyone had any right to hesitate in their obedience, it was Abraham. If anybody had a right to say, God, this is a bit crazy. This is a bit cray cray. (laughs) What are we doing here? If anybody had that if anybody had that right it would be Abraham. Here he was a man over 100 years old at this point and finally the father of his prime of his promised heir Isaac was the man. Isaac was the man that was going to bring it. Isaac was the man that was going to set this generation up for generation after generation after generation just as God had promised. And now God God you're asking me to sacrifice it. I believe that if we were in Abraham's shoes, we probably would have tried our best to obey God. We probably would have really tried. But we would have at least delayed that obedience as long as we could. But nowhere does it say that Abraham delayed. Nowhere does Scripture imply that he put it off so that he could spend some precious quality time with his son before he had to give him up. Nowhere does it indicate that he waited any length of time. He got ready and went immediately. He obeyed immediately. Thomas A. Kempis, he said instant obedience is the only kind of obedience there is. Delayed obedience is disobedience. How many times have we felt God leading us to do something? How many times have we felt God lead us to do something, and maybe we've agreed that we would do it, but we we put it off? Yeah, I'll get to that, Lord. I'll, I'll do that, but in my own time, when I'm ready. How many times have we been guilty of hesitating in our obedience? How often is our obedience delayed? When we delay in our obedience, we are actually disobeying. God desires and requires instant obedience. He, as our Father, desires that we, as his children, we are his children. Can I get a hallelujah on that? Will not delay in following his leadership. And if we truly are people of faith, then that faith should cause us to obey immediately. The second principle that I think we can see in the life of Abraham is that faith causes us to obey unquestionably. When God called Abraham to leave his family, his friends, and his home behind, not once do we ever see him saying, why? Why are you, leaving? Why are you allowing me to leave the comforts of home? Why are you telling me to go from where I'm comfortable to some place that I don't even know about? Strange food, strangers in that land. I I don't know their culture. I don't know their customs. It was a strange circumstance, but never once does Abraham question God. He doesn't question God's reasoning for taking him up out of his comfort zone and sending him out on some blind voyage. 
Never once does he give some sort of excuse for why he doesn't think it's a good idea. No, he simply gets up and leaves. He packs all of his stuff. He takes his wife, his nephew, and all their belongings, and he heads out. What about when God told him to offer up his son Isaac as a sacrifice? You better believe that most of us would probably have argued with God a little bit. We'd have something to say. God, it's not just that, that simple. You want me to sacrifice my promise. You want me to actually tie up my son, lay him down on a stone altar, slay him like he was a goat, and then burn him? What kind of God are you? We'd have a lot of questions. Maybe we wouldn't be so defiant in our answer, but maybe, just maybe we would. To say the least, it would be extremely difficult not to question God on this one. God, this is a son that you promised me. This is the boy that I've waited 25 years for. This is the one who said that, who you said that was going to carry the bloodline. This is the child that would be the heir and one of the fathers of the new mighty nation. Are you sure that you want me to kill him? Why did you allow me to have him in the first place if you were just going to take him away? Why would you even fulfill the promise if it was just going to be ripped from my hands? On and on, Abraham could have gone, and we probably would have if we were in his shoes, but once... Not once does he ever question God. Not once does he utter a word trying to change God's mind and say, God, it's not so. Not once does he ever make any excuses why this isn't the way that things should be done. In fact, he did everything in his power to keep himself from having any excuses at all. He never questioned God. He just simply rose speechless to the call of God. If we aren't careful, we can fabricate good reasons why we're not going to do what God tells us to do. If we're not careful, we can say, well, God, there's this reason. There's that reason why I can't. Are you really sure that this is what I'm supposed to do? We lay fleeces out before God and we say, okay, if this certain song plays with this tempo, then I'll do what you told me to do. <laughs> we, say, we, we put these fleeces out to God. We say, okay, you know, if this person comes and talks to me and says this word in their speech, then I know that, that I'm supposed to do what you're calling me to do. And we lay out these fleeces and we say, okay, that, you know, if that happens, then I'll follow you. And God's not looking for us to lay out a fleece before him. God's not looking for any excuses. He's just looking for an immediate response to say, God, I'll do your will. No matter how crazy it may seem, no matter how difficult it may be, I will follow you. I will do your will. I will obey in faith. The, the kind of unquestioning obedience that Abraham had and that you and I should have only comes from a complete faith in God and in his promises. That brings me to my next point. Faith causes us to obey confidently. When Hudson Taylor went to China, he made the voyage on a sailing vessel, and uh, as it neared the channel between the southern Malaya uh, Peninsula and the island of Sumatra, the missionary heard an urgent knock on the stateroom door. He could tell if it was an emergent nature just by the knock, and he opened it, and he stood there, and there was the captain of the ship. Mr. Taylor, he said, we have no wind. We are drifting toward an island where the people are heathen, and I fear they are cannibals. What can I do, asked Taylor. I understand that you believe in God. I want you to pray for wind. Pray for wind. All right, Captain, I will, but you must set sail. He said, well, that's ridiculous. There's not even the slightest breeze right now. Besides, the sailors will think I'm crazy for just setting sail when there's not even any wind. But finally, because of Taylor's insistence, he agreed. And 45 minutes later, he returned and found the missionary still on his knees. You can stop praying now, said the captain. We've got more wind than we know what to do with. Sometimes we need to prepare in faith for what God is going to do in our life. We might not see the answer. We, it might seem crazy. And others might think that we're crazy for doing what we're doing. But if we've heard from God, that's all that matters. Is there any other greater voice than God? No, there's not. And uh, Abraham's faith, it caused him to be able to obey God immediately and unquestionably, knowing that God's word could be trusted. In the first case, God had promised that if Abraham left his family and home behind, that he would make a great nation out of him. If he left the comforts of where he was, God was going to use him mightily. 
He had promised that if he obeyed, he would bless him. And he had promised that every nation would be blessed through Abraham if he only obeyed. So being a man of faith, he was able to step away from everything that he ever knew, confident that God was going to stay true to his promises. God, I know you're going to keep your word, so I'll do what you've asked me to do. He didn't doubt God, but he believed God. He had confidence in him. And Abraham, he walked Isaac to that mountain of sacrifice immediately and unquestionably because he was confident in God's promises. God had promised that it would be through Isaac that this new nation would rise up. God had promised that Isaac would be his heir. And Abraham believed so completely in that promise that he was willing to actually lay his own son on the altar and kill him, knowing that God would keep his word, even if it meant that Isaac, even, even if it meant that God had to raise Isaac from the dead. That's what he believed. Uh, J.G. Machen, he said, the more we know of God, the more unreservedly we will trust him. The greater our progress in theology, the simpler and more childlike will be our faith. You can only obey God the same way that Abraham did because, we, because he knew that God always keeps his word. And the longer, the longer that you walk with God, the more you see that to be true and the greater your confidence will grow. Abraham was confident in God because God had always kept his word before. During one of the world wars, a father, he was holding his, his small son by the hand. I just want you to, to get this picture in your mind for a second. And they were, ran from a building that had been struck by a bomb, and in the front yard was a shell hole. Seeking shelter as quickly as possible, the father jumped into the hole and held up his arms for his son to follow. And terrified, yet hearing his father's voice telling him to jump, the boy replied, I can't see you. The father, looking up against the sky that was tinted red by the burning buildings, called to the silhouette of his son and said, but I can see you jump. And the boy did. He was able to obey his father with confidence because he had learned to trust in him. Faith does not mean that we see things that are going to happen. If you're seeing everything, it doesn't require faith to follow that. It doesn't require faith to step out and say, yeah, I'm going to follow that. Faith is when we don't see it and we still follow it. And it's easier said than done. Let me ask you, how many times has God let you down before? How often has he destroyed your confidence in him? How many times has he not kept his word? Never. So you couldn't obey him even when you don't completely understand his call because you know that he stays true to his word. You can obey him with complete confidence. Abraham, Isaac, and their servants, they journey to a place of sacrifice. And Isaac says, here's the wood for the, and the fire for the sacrifice, but where is the sacrifice? You know that panicky feeling that comes over you whenever you leave home and you realize, oh my goodness, did I turn off the stove? You know that panicky feeling? I, I, I think Isaac had that a little bit in this story. Okay, you know, I know... Dad, that you said that you prepared everything, that you got everything ready to go for this trip. And we do have the wood and the fire, and that's good, but I, I, we don't have anything to sacrifice. We're kind of missing something here. Abraham, he replies to his son, and he says, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Abraham and Isaac, they travel up the mountain alone. And I imagine in the back of Abraham's mind, he might have thought, okay, two men walk up, one man walks down. They go up this mountain, and they get up there, and once on top of the mountain, Abraham, he willingly and without hesitation, he lays Isaac on the altar. And Abraham, he takes his knife, and he raises it up in the air. Right before he plunges that knife into his son, an angel of the Lord appears to them and stops Abraham right in his tracks. And he's thankful for God's intervention. Genesis chapter 22, it tells us a story. It says in verse 11, it says, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. Again, Abraham, always ready to hear from God. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. 
This is why Abraham is considered faithful. He didn't withhold anything from God. Whatever God asked of him, no matter how difficult it seems, Abraham obeyed God with confidence. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, it says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? As in obeying. It's not so much about the sacrifice. He says, this, In obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. David, he said in Psalm 51, verse 16, he said, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, that will not despise. It, it's not about the sacrifice. It's about Abraham's willingness to obey God. When God asks you to give up the thing that you love the most, when God asks you to give up and give to him, hand over to him your baby, That's what he's looking for. He's not looking to destroy anything. He's not looking to wreck all of our hopes and dreams and say, okay, I gave you this promise and now I'm going to pull the rug out from underneath you. That's not what God does. God, he's just looking for you to obey. He wants to know that you're always ready and willing to hear, to hear and heed his voice. It's one thing about saying, yes, God, I'll follow you, but it's another thing about doing God is not looking for your sacrifice as much as he is looking for your obedience. And looking back now, we understand that Abraham's confidence and faith that led to obedience was well-founded. If we could all stand, I'm going to come to a close. Everybody say hallelujah. Getting closer to lunchtime. Glory. And uh, everything that God promised came to pass. Abraham, if I could have the music come back too, Abraham did, fa did father a great nation. The nation did, did come through Isaac. That nation was blessed. And through Abraham's descendants, Jesus came. That's the bloodline that Jesus used. Through that bloodline of Abraham. You think that God was wanting to destroy all of that? No. But a lot of times we get confused. And that's all right. That's human. We get confused and we think God's against us. He's got to be doing this to hurt me because right now I'm hurting bad. All this, all, all this stuff that's happening in my life, it doesn't make any sense. Why would God allow this to happen? Why would God ask me to do such a difficult thing? And we can look at that and we, we can be so confused. Like, God, do you really know what you're doing? And if we allow ourselves, we can think that God's just trying to destroy me. No, God is trying to make you. Do you think that Abraham ever would have made it into the faith chapter had he not actually obeyed God's voice? And in fact, we look to him more than any of the others that are in the faith chapter. There's more written about him in the faith chapter than more than any other. Why? Because he was willing to do whatever God had asked. God, it doesn't matter what you're going to ask me to do. I'm going to do it. I'm going to obey your voice. I'm going to heed to you. And Abraham, he had reason. He had good reason to be confident and to obey confidently because he knew, he knew God. He knew that voice. God, I know when you speak to me. I'm not confused with any other voices that are going on right now in this world. I'm not confused with anything else that anybody else is talking to me about. I know your voice. The Bible says that his sheep know his voice. The sheep know the shepherd's voice. Pastor, he's talked to, a, uh, to you guys about it before, and I'll just reiterate this point. Pastor, he used to shepherd sheep. And anybody else could have called those sheep. They could have called as loud as they wanted to for those sheep to come in to eat. They wouldn't have come. Pastor, he steps out to the forefront, and he calls for those sheep, and all of them come running. They were waiting for the shepherd's voice. Through all the voices that are going on and trying to pull apart your faith here this morning, I want you just to listen to one voice. I believe that God's speaking to me here this morning for you. There's somebody in here that is carrying things in this service that you don't understand. 
and you've questioned, why is this happening? What is going on? Does God know that I still exist? Does he know how much this affects me? And maybe you've walked into here wondering, how am I going to get through this? I'll just get through this day. Even though you may not see the future, you can obey confidently. I want to give you this encouragement here this morning that knowing you have to know that God will always keep his promise. There's a lot that we can learn from Abraham, but one of the greatest things that we can learn from him is how to be a people of faith in the face of obscurity, in the face of confusion, in the face of everything else that that is pushed up against us. How do we hold on to that? Without obedience, we cannot say that we have faith. But with obedience, our faith comes alive. We activate our faith by obedience. God, I've heard your word for my life, and I'm going to obey. And true faith will cause that obedience to be immediate, unquestioning, and confident. Amen. We're going to open up this altar here this morning. I challenge you to come and lay everything on the altar here this morning. God's not going to destroy you. He's going to see you through. And the very thing that he seems to be asking you to give to him, that thing that you hold so dear, your baby, he's going to take care of that. And he's going to make it into something great. But you've got to give it to him. You've got to give it to him. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Speak to us, God. Praise your name, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise your name, God. God's not out to get you. God is for you, not against you. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, I give it to you, Lord. Might not make sense, God. Might not make sense, Lord, but I give you everything, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. I give, it, I give up all doubt. I give up all reasoning. God, I give up, Lord. My questioning, my concerns, Lord, I give it all to you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise your name, Jesus.